All right, it's recording now. All right, so actually you don't have to do anything because it, it got both screens on. Uh, so you can sit over there if you want. Hi guys, sorry for the wait. I was trying to figure out how to record. Um, we're gonna try it one more time, see if it works. Uh, updates, the, the, the test was graded. I finished grading yesterday and I, and I finished uh, writing down the grades today. There is one person who didn't take the test, like just in general, so I don't know if he's still in the class or not. So I don't know if you haven't, if you didn't take the test, I guess come talk to me. I don't know. Um, what, what was that? Yeah, the average was uh, 76, 76. Um, so everybody did relatively okay. The big problem with the test was uh, problem number four, uh, where basically everybody did Poorly. There was a couple people who got it perfectly correct. Uh, I graded problem one and problem three, so I didn't really check what you guys did wrong on four or two. Uh, that was the pool that. So once you guys get your tests back, or you, I guess your grades back, uh, I don't know if he is going to want you guys to have the test back. Um, I don't know how that works. But uh, you guys, depending on what problem you guys want to ask questions about, you can either refer to to him or to me. So if it's about one and three, I could talk to you. If it's about two and four, he, he could talk to you more in detail because we both have our, like a little bit different grading criteria. Uh, I think his criteria is a little more vague, so you might not be able to decipher exactly how he took off the points. Um, but if you do have questions, please do ask him about those questions. Um, any questions about the test? No? I should be, I think we should be uploading the, the grades probably uh, Monday, because there's one more person that still has to take the test, so I, that's why we can't give him back yet, uh, and we don't know if he's going to take the same test or if he's going to do like an oral test or some, or some other way of doing it, because he had like an emergency or something. Um, so that's that for the test. Now, uh, about what, so last week, right, we didn't have a discussion section, so there's a lot to cover today. It's basically all of chapter four. Uh, I'll see how much I can get through. If at some point I feel like we're not getting much accomplished, then I'll stop and we'll continue next time. Uh, but I'll try to cover as much as I can in a clear, concise way. So, um, so up to now, right, everything before the test, we covered the basics of elasticity. And we also... We covered the basics of elasticity, and then uh, we talked about this first uh, loading uh, it, it, that's typical in aircraft structures, which is torsion, right? Uh, like I mentioned earlier in the class, there are other types of loading uh, that are very important for aircraft structures, and it's namely um, bending and uh, transverse loads that produce uh, shear forces. So that's what uh, sh chapter four is about. And that's what I'll talk about today. So chapter four. Chapter four, it's bending. And Flexural shear. All right. So the way we're going to talk about this topic here is we're going to start again with the simplest case, which is the two-dimensional analysis. And then once we kind of get a grasp of how that works, then we'll proceed into the three-dimensional, more general cases. Um, so with that being said, in 2D, uh, we're typically dealing in this chapter with beams, right? So a beam has three different dimensions that define it, right? It's its length, its depth, we can call it, I guess, what do we call it here, H? And then the, the measurement into the plane, which is its width, right? We call it its width, so whatever, right? W with. Okay. Um, 
And in this type of analysis, this, the type of analysis I'm about to cover, uh, these dimensions matter, right? The proportion of these dimensions matter. Uh, there are different theories you can use or simplifications you can use when you have certain dimensions that are larger than others. For this portion that I'm going to cover today in class, I'm going to be going the Euler, uh, over the Euler-Bernoulli beam theory, which is, is good for situations where L is really long compared to this, these two other dimensions. Okay? If it's a very short beam, then you can't use Euler-Bernoulli. You can use it, but it's not going to be as accurate as using something else like Timoshenko beam theory. Uh, I'm not going to cover Timoshenko today. Uh, I think uh, Sepulveda covered it in class. Right? So I'm just going to go over Euler-Bernoulli. And uh, yeah, okay, what else? So with these beams, actually, let's define the coordinate system. So if you guys remember in the torsion problems that we did previously, this longitudinal axis was actually the z-axis. Now for these bending problems, we're going to kind of switch up the nomenclature. And this longitudinal axis is going to be the x-axis. Nothing really changes, just they define it like this because that's how it's classically defined for these problems. Uh, nothing's really that different. Just x, y, z. And uh, these cross-sections that we're going to be dealing with when we're dealing with a 2D problem are symmetric cross-sections. So if this is the beam that we're looking at from the side, the cross-section would have to be symmetric, right? Something like that. And right, this would be the centroid. This would be Y. This would be Z. Okay. And these beams can be subjected to all kinds of different loads. Right? You can apply something at the end, like a bending moment. You could pull it with an axial load. Or you can subject it to a transverse load that's acting on the top surface or the bottom surface or any of the surfaces that go around the beam. Uh, and this, this, this load can be distributed in whatever fashion, you know, that you want, I guess. Right, so this would be P. That could vary with X, right? Um, you can imagine these beams are going to deflect depending on what load you're applying. And what we're trying to find out in this chapter is how these beams are deflecting. How much are they changing shape? and what stresses are developing within them, and what strains for that matter. Um, okay. So, in general, when we're talking about how this thing deflects, we care about two types of displacements. The horizontal displacement and the vertical displacement in any given point along the beam. Right? So those are the two most important Displacement values are U and W, right? Um, and those can be both functions of X and Z. In this 2D approximation, we're assuming that it's, this W parameter is so thin that it's constant throughout that, that dimension. So we're dealing with a plane stress problem. And so now we're only looking at the analysis from the X, Z plane. So these are the only two uh, parameters that matter. And if we were going to write out basically the, an expansion of what it, this, could, this could be, you know, given the highest order possible, we could expand it all the way to whatever order we want, right? Uh, however, in any one of these beam theories, what we're doing is basically truncating this uh, expanded expression down to the first order. Because uh, z, we're assuming to be relatively small compared to x. So we truncate this down to the following. Right, so we get rid of that, that, and that. The reason we don't get rid of this term right here is because we still care about how the cross-section at each one of these x-locations changes 
Uh, so that's why we don't get rid of that, this term right here. So this is why this term is important. Because that tells you basically how each cross section, if it was originally, you know, um, let's say perfectly perpendicular to this normal, to this, to this neutral plane, right? This cross section was originally like that. After loading, if you have some value for this, let's say three or five, whatever, it, this u is going to vary with z, right? So at z equals zero, it's going to be zero, but it, it's going to have a certain slope now, right? So the cross section is going to change. So that's how much it horizontally changes. Um, and so th that's why that, that term is still important. That's why we keep it after this, this truncation. Okay? All right. So I'll be honest with you guys, before this class, I was just writing down exactly what was on the book. And so right now I'm trying to figure out what's most important to keep. I don't want to go over the full theory because I feel like it's a waste of time. So as I go, I'm going to try to read and be like, okay, this is important, this is important. Um, okay. So let's see. Okay. Let me continue. All right, so from those uh, displacements, we can figure out the strain, right? Remember the goal of this whole approach is to figure out what the strains and therefore the stresses are uh, for any given structure. But the way you typically start these analyses is by, by defining an approximation for what you think uh, the displacements are going to be. And from those displacements, you can get strains. So remember, the strain is simple, right? du, dx. And then gamma x z. That's um, d w d x plus d u d z. So this equals Okay. Uh, in this analysis, we're going to call this function, we're going to call it uh, phi y or, or psi. Let's call it psi y. Uh, so psi y, that's, what, that's what's being replaced. It's the exact same thing as u1x, same thing. Uh, so this, these are the strains now. The simplification that we're making in the euler benoit beam theory Right, so EB beam theory is that gamma XZ equals zero. Okay, that is the main simplification. So in, in Timoshenko beam theory, this is not the case, but it, in the, this first most basic beam theory, gamma XZ equals zero. Uh, what that what it, that's telling us, right, is if we look at this equation and we set that equal to zero, then dw dx equals negative phi or negative psi y. Uh, what that's saying, all that's saying, to put it in simple terms, is that dw dx is basically the slope of the deflection, right? So w the function of the function w, right? So w is going to be the vertical displacement. So that's going to tell you the shape of the beam after deformation. Okay, dw dx is going to tell you the slope, right? So whatever the, that function is, right? So here it would be you know positive zero, negative zero, positive, you know whatever. Um, so dw dx is the slope of it. That slope tells you how much basically it's, it's uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the slope of the beam. That slope of the beam in Euler-Bernoulli beam theory, that angle of the beam is going to be 
the, the same magnitude but the opposite direction of um, this u1x that we described previous, previously. So all that's saying is that the cross sections remain completely perpendicular to that neutral axis, right? So after the bending, right, so we start with a beam like this, and then it, you know, bends down to this position, right? Originally, let's look at this end face. The cross section at that point is perpendicular to the neutral axis. In Euler Bernoulli beam theory, this still remains perpendicular. Okay? So this is the angle change of the of the cross section, and this is the angle change of the beam, of the length of the beam. And if these two are equal, then those have to be equal at the opposite they have to be perpendicular to each other. This is basically the simplification that we're making in Euler Bernoulli beam theory. Um, however, this is, it, it works as simplification, makes things a lot simpler, but it's really not the case. It only really works when you have very long slender beams and also um, it works as an exact solution. It, it makes, lets you arrive at an exact solution when you're only considering bending. If you have any shear forces acting on this thing, this doesn't give you an exact solution. Uh, just to kind of illustrate what I'm talking about here, let me see if I have some. Uh. Right, so for example, we can consider this, this cross, this beam. Let's imagine this is a beam, right? a rectangular beam. If we bend it, right, if we bend it, the cross section, right, if we bend, let's say we bend it up, the cross section is never really perpendicular to the neutral axis. You can see that when it's bending there, that the neutral axis is kind of pointing to in a different angle as the, as the normal, right? So if it was perfectly perpendicular, you, the cut would be right there. But you can see that the cut is over here, right? So there's an angle between that. And so that's why something like this, right, a shorter beam doesn't really work for uh, doesn't really match, you know, the simplification from Euler Bernoulli beam theory. Um, and so, yeah, hopefully that makes a little more sense. Maybe it's more confusing. All right. So now we got the, the strains. Uh, and now we want to talk about the stresses. So, oh, I guess another important point. is the resultant forces from the stresses that are developed inside uh, the structure. Right? We've talked about um, boundary conditions, okay? And so how a certain load has to be the same as the resulting force that results from the internal stresses, right? So if a structure has a lot of internal stresses, let's say a lot of stresses sigma xx, these sigma xx's if you integrate them over a surface, they're going to result in a force, right? And that force has to be the same, you know, at the boundary as whatever is being applied. And so there's two types of forces in these types of problems. There's a, let's say an axial force. Let's say we have a beam, right? And we have right, an X. And then we could have a, a bending moment, right? M Y. Okay. Uh, N X is going to be the integral, double integral of sigma X X D A and M Y is going to be double integral Z sigma X X D A. Right. This Hopefully it makes sense, right? If you have a certain distribution, let's say this is the neutral axis, you have a distribution of sigma xx like this. 
there's the case of pure bending, right, where it's like linear with z. Um, in this case, if it's pure bending, you could integrate that and find out that nx equals zero. So there is no axial load. However, if you integrate this up and down with z, uh, you'll, you'll be given a certain moment, right, and why. So just kind of illustrating that. Um, an important thing, the, the subscripts are the axis upon which it's being acted, right? So it's important to remember that because uh, when we do bidirectional bending, there's a lot of subscripts and it gets kind of confusing. So M, MY is the moment about the y-axis, right? So remember the y-axis here goes in plane, in, uh, in, into the page, I guess. And then uh, if we had an MZ, it would be rotating about this axis, right? But we don't really care about this in this case. But remember, these subscripts are the axis it's acting about. Um, so we talked about that. So now that we know these, right, we, we want to know what exactly, how do we figure out from these displacements what these stresses, these thermal stresses are within the body. And so those, we're going to use Hooke's law, right, which as we know, ends up being... So those are the stresses, um, let me see. And what we're trying to do here is find a way to relate the applied moments or normal forces to, to these stresses, okay? And so I'm gonna just write these out again, sorry about that, a little confusing. Okay, so so we basically plug in sigma xx here and here, and we're actually going to do the integrals. I'm going to save you all that step because it's a little bit too much writing. Um, but we end up with the equation nx equals ea du0 dx and my equals negative ei eiy. squared, where I, Y equals integral the A, and this is the moment of inertia um, about the Y axis. Okay. So, we have those two equations. Let me see what else is important here. Okay.
Okay. All right, so this is how these external forces are related to the displacement functions that we talked about earlier. Uh, another important thing to discuss here is uh, one of these issues with the Euler Bernoulli beam theory. And the issue is that we basically said that these uh, cross sections of these bars remain perpendicular to the neutral axis. Okay, so like I said, the simplification was that gamma xz equals zero. If we say that that's zero, then we're also saying that tau xz also equals to zero. However, that's clearly not the case for these problems. Okay, so this is, a, this is an issue that we have to solve uh, because if this is zero, then we can't get tau xz from this. So we have to find a different way of getting tau xz from some of our other parameters, okay? Um, typically, we would get tau xz from finding out what, you know, we have these displacements, then we can get this, and then we can get this. But like I said, we, this is zero, so this is going to be zero. So we have to find a different relation that can give us this value. So what we find instead of tau xz in these problems is we find vz, which is the resultant shear force at any one of these cross sections, okay? And so that is the integral of tau xz dA at any one of these cross sections, okay? There's a relationship between an applied force so let me see where I can draw it. Okay. And so the way we find this VZ, which is very important, where we find VZ, right? We can't find tau XZ, so we need to find VZ, is we find it using equilibrium. So let's assume we have a beam and it's loaded like I showed earlier, right? Some, some loading condition, let's say it's pointing up. We look at this small piece there, and let's say it's also subjected to some bending moment. Uh, we look at a small piece of that beam. So if you have a beam and you loaded, let's say with some transverse load and with some bending moment, you're going to have a distribution of moments within the beam. You guys might remember from your previous classes, you do these bending and shear diagrams where this is V, this is M, there's a distribution, some distribution of that. So at any given point, you're going to have some M and some V. And what we're trying to find is this V that I've been talking about. So we have, at this small piece that we cut out from the beam, we have some MY, and then later down the, further down the beam, we're going to have that MY plus some delta MY, assuming that it's changing. Same thing with VZ. On, on one side, right, at that, that one place we made a cut, we have some resulting VZ from this applied uh, P, and from this moment, of course, it's all, it's all intertwined, and at some point further down the beam, we have that same VZ plus some delta VZ, assuming that it's changing. Um, and so with this, we can find a relationship between VZ, the applied P, and M, MY. And so that's how we typically find these transverse uh, shear forces. And so that relationship uh, ends up being, well, first, there's a relationship between VZ and, the, and P. So we end up finding that dvz dx equals negative pz. So that's equation one right there. And 
dmy dx equals vz. Yeah. So we have these two equations that tell us how the moments, right? So we know how to find the moments because we know that this, the, the basically the shape. This is given by the shape of the beam, okay? This second derivative of w with respect to x. We can find the moments, and so from those moments, we can also find vz, and we can also find, you know, we can find v from p, and they're all, they're all you know, interrelated. So, okay, what else, what else is important here? So this leads us to the Bernoulli beam equation. Basically by combining those two equations and going back here, right? So that equation, that equation, and this equation, then we're left with the following equation, which is E, I y so that's the equation that basically describes how uh, one of these beams reacts uh, to the loading uh, PZ so that's the Euler Bernoulli beam equation Okay. All right. All right. And so you could actually solve that explicitly, you know, if you're given PZ and you might be given some boundary conditions with regards to M. So when you're given a, a, a M boundary condition, you're being explicitly told what the second derivative of W is. Um, and you might be given some specific boundary conditions with respect to W, and with all those boundary conditions you can solve. The ultimate goal in these 2D beam problems is to solve for an expression of Wx, right? And so you'd basically integrate this four times, you'd get four constants, and you would solve for those constants given the whatever boundary conditions that you're given. And so that's typically the goal. Uh, I covered this just for the, the, the hope of trying to explain it. Uh, hopefully it made a little bit of sense. You're not going to have to do a lot of problems when you do this integration, so don't worry too much about it. It's just kind of to get you thinking about the theory of what bending is and what it results in. Um, and so, if, yeah, and it, uh, I guess I'll write the other more important equations too. All right, so for these problems, for these bending problems, so in the absence of one of these normal forces, right, so nx of nx, uh, so in these, in these problems, we're going to have just only m's applied on the beam. If that's the case, then we're going to use the following equations to find the strain and the stress at any given point. So epsilon xx is going to equal my z e i y and sigma xx is going to equal my z i y. All right. So in these problems, right, you might be given a beam and they'll apply some bending moment MY. Uh, if they give you a cross section, you find IY. These are extremely simple, so you're probably not going to ever do a problem like this. But you can find IY and they're giving you an applied M MY and they ask you well, where does the maximum compressive 
um, stress happen, or the, where does the maximum stress happen? And so basically, you can tell that it varies with z, right? So if this is a one that's symmetric, the highest stress happens at the location furthest away from this neutral axis, right? Z is defined. The origin of Z is at, at this centroid. So if it's bending like that, the stress down here is going to be compressive, right? This is tensile. And since it's linear, there's a point in the middle where it's zero. So that's what we call the neutral axis. And so this is all in 2D, relatively simple. Uh, and I'm just, you know, hope if, if you get this, then it's going to be really easy to understand the 3D version, which is the bidirectional bending. And bidirectional bending, what we're trying to do is basically the exact same thing as this, except we have a three-dimensional beam, and we can apply not only MY, we can apply MZ. And also, there's geometrical properties that have... Uh, pr that matter in the z direction, right? So we have only uh, this this moment of inertia, but we also, in, if we include the three-dimensional uh, plane, we're also going to have i z, and we're going to have a product of iner inertia i y z. So there's a lot more terms involved. But for 2D, the equations are really easy. Um, so yeah, that's that. And so now I'm going to talk about bidirectional bending. Is there any questions about the 2D Euler Bernoulli. If so, just speak up. All right. So this is chapter 4.2. Bidirectional. Bidirectional bending. All right, so I'm going to draw an example of a beam. See, all right. So um, another simplification that we made in this problem, not simplification, but assumption in all these equations is that the beam was symmetric about the, the z-axis. Okay, I talked about it in the, in, the, in the beginning, and that's very important uh, because you reduce all of the terms that you need for these equations. In bidirectional bending, it's basically the most general case you can have. Right? It's a non-symmetric cross-section and you're adding this third dimension where you can apply forces, right? So we have this PZ, which is the same as we were talking about previously, but now we also have this other force that can act perpendicular to that PY. Uh, and uh, we're still using Euler-Bernoulli for, th for these problems. It's just in three dimensions. So the displacements that we care about now, I'm not going to go too in-depth here because I don't think it's very helpful, but... All right, so it's the exact same thing. Um, the reason these stay in, does that make sense? Yeah. The reason these stay in is because we care how, um, how this, this cross-sectional face changes. Um, but over here, we don't really, we just really care about the shape of the beam, 
right? So these tell us about the, how the cross-sectional shape changes. I think that's supposed to be Z. Um, oh, no, this is Y. OK. So let me see what I can skip here. Uh, an important thing about the moments, yeah, I'm going to skip basically the whole theory part. Is not, I don't think it's helpful at all. Uh, I'm just going to do some, some of the important points. Um, the convention for these problems, right, this is the y-axis, the z-axis. My is still the same as in the previous situation, right? So it's positive. You follow right-hand rule, right? So you go to pointing in the y, your thumb in the y, your fingers point down. That's the positive my. But it's the opposite for mz, right? For mz to be positive, thumb points down, okay? So this is positive mz. It's just the way the coordinates are defined uh, in those equations that I was showing previously, the angles. Um, so that's important. Let me see. Yeah, I'm just going to skip to the most important parts. Like we were talking about previously, we care, right? We, we have this structure. We're applying bending moments, right, which are the loads uh, that let's say that we know. And we're trying to figure out if this structure fails or not. So we're optimally, we're ultimately trying to find what the sigma xx is. So we're trying to find that equation that relates sigma xx to the applied my. In this case, in this case, we're trying to find sigma xx as it relates to the applied my and mz. So the equation in that case is going to be a lot longer. So I'll try not to make any mistakes. But the equation is sigma xx equals y i y i z minus the product i y z this is times y plus Okay, so this is the most general equation you can possibly have for these problems. Uh, as you can see, it has a lot of terms. Typically, in these problems, you're going to be given the shape of the beam. And if you know the shape of the beam or the cross-section that you're looking at, then you know IY, you know uh, IZ, you know IYZ. Okay, uh, I'll write down how those are defined in a bit, but everybody's writing this down, so I'll give it a, a second. Um, and as you can see, uh, sigma xx varies with both y and z linearly, okay? So it's like a, it's like a plane. Uh, and there's a point in that plane where sigma, not the point, but a whole plane where sigma, x, sigma xx equals to zero. Uh, and how, and in the same way that in this case, there was a location, a z location, where sigma xx equal to zero. In these three-dimensional problems, there's a whole plane where sigma xx equals to zero. And oftentimes, we're trying to find that. Uh, and before I, before I get into that, I'll just write out the definition of iy, iz. So iy Okay, so moment of inertia about the y-axis, moment of inertia about the z-axis, and moment the product of inertia. Um, typically for these problems, yeah, 
Is this one supposed to be squared? Oh, right here? Yeah. Yeah, sorry about that. Good catch, good catch. Um, okay, yeah. So these are the moments of inertia, and you can find that just given the, the geometry. So that's relatively easy. That's typically one of the first things you do in these problems. You'll find that, and then you can just plug it into this equation, and uh, you can just basically uh, plug in whatever point zy in the cross section you're interested in. You can find the stress uh, sigma xx. Uh, like I was mentioning earlier, one of the things that they typically ask you for these problems is where is the neutral plane? Um, so, like I said, the neutral plane is the plane on which where sigma xx is equal to zero. So all we do to find that is we set this equal to zero, okay, and we'll find some ratio between z and y, right? This is just going to be a number, and that's just going to be a number. And with that ratio, we can find a certain angle, okay? So the equation to find this neutral plane So location to find the neutral plane, right? So neutral plane is where sigma xx equals to zero. In 2D problems, it's just a, a certain position z. Uh, in 3D problems, it's a, it's a whole plane. So you're, it's going to be defined by a certain angle. Uh, and so the equation is tangent of alpha. Alpha is, alpha is the angle. Uh, it's going to equal negative z over y, which equals i y m z minus i y z. The same equation is over there. M y over i z i y z m z. So. Um, Basically, if you want to find alpha, take the arc, arctan of, of that fraction that you see over there. Uh, and another important thing, another convention that is, is made for these problems, if you have a, some cross-section, centroid, this is, uh, we call this what, y, z. Alpha is defined as positive going clockwise, okay? So if you get a positive number, let's say positive 30 degrees, you go 30 degrees down from the y-axis. Okay. This is positive pointing down. And so that 30 degrees tells you that the orientation of the plane. So you could just draw it and extend it all the way to the other end. Okay. That is the neutral plane for this cross section. Another reason why the neutral plane is very important is because the highest, same as in the 2D problem, the highest stress, both compressive and tensile, happen in the location that's furthest away from that neutral plane. So in this kind of abstract little cross-section I, I drew here, the furthest position from the neutral plane, perpendicularly, right, it'd be here, and the opposite would be here, right? If we're doing some sort of bending, let's say in this direction, right? Positive my, let's say. Then this would be compressive, and this would be tensile. Okay. And uh, another important property of the neutral plane is it's that's the boundary at which it the stresses in the cross section change from tensile. To compressive and vice versa right so anywhere down here is going to be compressive anywhere up here is going to be tensile so and it's just because these equations are linear and those this is all stemming from the assumptions that we made at the very beginning where we only left the linear uh terms of z right so we only e times this and z times that that's why this is ending up the way it is but it's it's a reasonably good assumption um okay
All right, I'm just going to write out the equations that I wrote previously for the 2D problem, the equations that relate moments to shear forces uh, and shear forces to applied loads, but uh, for now for 3D, so a little more general. Uh, so I'll just write them over here. So the equations are basically the same, except we're, we're increasing uh, one of these dimensions. Uh, oh, another important fact is that a lot of these problems are simplified tremendously if you have some sort of symmetry. Okay, if your cross section is symmetric about either the z or y axis, then i y z equal to zero. And so that, that whole long equation that I had just written down simplifies a lot. So on a lot of the problems that you're going to be given, this is going to be the case. So just remember that. So you don't have to be, you know, think writing out all these equations and stuff. So, and also, okay, so the, the equilibrium um, equations Those are the equilibrium equations and how uh, an applied force is related uh, to these, uh, these shear forces and how these shear forces are related to, to the distribution of the moments across a, a cross section. These equations basically tell you how to do these shear moment diagrams. Uh, we're not really going to have to do that until the next chapter, uh, but it's really easy to do. I'll go over like basically the step-by-step -step guide as to how to do the shear moment diagrams. Right now, since we're only dealing with bending, we don't have to do that. And then also I'm going to write out the Euler-Bernoulli equation for these three, 3D problems. And then I'm going to do some examples and that's going to be it for today. So the Euler-Bernoulli equation has, is basically two equations now because we're dealing in, in 3D. So it's going to be EI by z All right, yeah, those are the two equations uh, for, to find the shape of these beams given, given a certain uh, applied P, okay? Um, and so you would integrate, there's, there's ways of solving these. I'm not gonna do any examples like that. But, but yeah, this is the equivalent of that other equation I had written down, but now in 3D. So that's the Euler-Bernoulli equation. And now, I guess the most important part of today, two examples. All right, so this is example 4.1. Example 4.1. Um, all right. So we're given the following structure. So it's a stringer web section, as we have seen before. Uh, 
Remember previously we were doing these torsional problems where we really only cared about these web portions because in, in these um, spar web structures, the, these webs are the ones that take the torsion. However, now we're not talking about torsion. We're talking about bending. And bending produces normal, normal stresses. And these normal stresses are going to be taken by these spars here. Right? So these are the important part for these, this analysis. Right, we don't really care about the webs anymore. They're basically meaningless. Uh, if, as we progress in the class and we're doing, doing combined load problems where there's a little bit of torsion, a little bit of bending, you know, normal stresses, then everything comes into play. But right now we're only looking at the bending. So we only care about these concentrated areas here. Um, so we're going to call this A1. This is A2. A3. A4. This side is 0.4 meters, 0.5 meters, 0.3 meters. Um, what else? So the problem that they're, they're giving us here, they're saying consider the loading MZ equals to zero, but MY does not equal to zero, right? So there's, there is some applied bending moment about the Y axis. Find the neutral axis. So find the neutral axis, right? Or neutral plane. Then you can call it whatever you want. Um, so find the, the neutral plane. And remember the, the, the property that we're looking for here is that alpha, that angle alpha that, um, that we talked about earlier. So how do we do these problems? Uh, we're going to go through a step by step kind of process. Uh, so let me see, am I missing anything in the drawing? 4.5.3. All right, so the first step, step one, for all, the, all these problems, is find the centroid. Before you do anything else, you've got to find the centroid, okay? And so there are equations to do that. And all you really need to find the centroid is the geometry that you're given. And so the equation to find the centroid is... YC equals summation of one. What the heck am I writing? Okay, so that's the equation to find uh, the centroid. YC and uh, ZC are the distances from the whatever axis you choose to that centroid. And so really the first step is not even finding the centroid. The first step is defining whatever coordinate system you want. And you could put the coordinate system wherever you want. It's typically easier, easier to define your coordinate system to coincide with the position of these points because then certain distances go to zero. So it simplifies your, your, your calculations, right? So in this problem, we're going to define it to be here. This is our original coordinate system, right? So this is Y, Z. That's not going to be our final coordinate system. This is just the initial one. With this initial coordinate system, we're going to find these two values, y bar, z bar. Those, like I said earlier, are distances away from this origin uh, at which the real centroid is. And once we find the centroid, then that's going to be the origin of our problem. Then, then we can solve for the other geometric properties. But right now we're going to, okay, we got that. Now we're going to plug in everything here. And so we actually plug in the things. It's going to be 0 times A1 plus 0 times A2 plus 0.5 times A3. Oh, I, let me see, I forgot something here. Yeah, A1, A2, A3. A1 equals 6 times 10 to the negative 4 meters squared. 
5 times 10 to the negative 4 meters squared. A3 equals A4 equals 4 times 10 to the negative 4 meters squared. Okay. So, uh, in these problems, they'll typically don't e they won't even tell you anything about the shape of these spars. It's just like little dots, but they'll give you an area. It's because they're concentrated areas in reality. They're, you could go in there and, and draw whatever real shape it is, but we don't really care about that. We really just care about the area and the distance away from the centroid. So that's why we, they don't go into too much detail as to what you know, the cross-section of these looks like. They just give you a certain value for A. Um, and then 0 0.5 times A4. And then you divide that by the summation of all the areas, A1 plus A2 plus A3 plus A4, right? And you end up getting 0.21 meters. And you do the same thing down here. You get 0.4 times A1 plus 0 times A2 plus 0 times A3 plus 0.3 times A4. All that divided by the summation, A1, A2, A3, A4. And that ends up equaling 0.19 meters so let's look at this let's just look at this top one all right this top is the product of whichever one of these concentrated areas you're looking at the distance y bar and the area uh, of that concentrated area so if we're looking at a1 we'll define this one as a1 the y position from this original coordinate system is zero so zero times a1 and then A2 is still right there at the origin, so 0, right? So 0 times A2, and then 0.5, right? This distance is 0.5 times A3, and then 0.5 because it's also along the same distance. So, and then you divide it by the entire summation of the areas of all of them. You do the same thing down there, except now you're dealing with the Z distance. Uh, and now you have these two values. With these two values, you take those two values from this original coordinate system, and you know you find that distance, so it's what 0.21 in the y direction and 0.19. So 0.21 is about maybe halfway, a little bit less, and then 0.19 is about halfway. So if you go here, that's the location of your centroid. Okay. And now from that centroid, you can go to step two. So step two is find the moments of inertia so finding the moments of inertia uh, and so each one of them right this is 3d bending so we need these three different moments of inertia uh, we need IY, IZ, and IYZ. So we'll go one by one. So IY, moment of inertia about the Y axis, is the summation AI, ZI squared. And so we can actually plug in. I'll explain this equation right now, actually. Might as well. This equation might not look like your typical moment of inertia equation. So this cross-section that we're looking here is not a solid section. Right? That's why we're not doing these integrals. Um, in a solid section, right, let's say this Z section. Okay? Centroid is there. We're going to do a problem just like this in a bit, but I might as well explain it now. Uh, you can divide it into three different shapes, three different rectangles, okay? And the total moment of inertia of that shape is going to be the summation of those three moments of inertia, okay? And the way you find the moments of inertia for each one of these shapes is you use the parallel axis theorem. You guys probably have done it before. Uh, and the parallel axis theorem tells you that IY, let's say for this one, right, is going to be the IY of the shape itself, 
right? Which what I don't know, b times b times t to the third power divided by 12, I think, for a rectangle, right? So let's say this is b, this is t, b t cubed over 12 plus a d squared. Okay. A d squared is the area of that shape, and d is the distance from the centroid. Okay. For these problems that we're doing here, we're disregarding this whole portion. Okay, we're only looking at this. That's why it's AZ squared. Because the distances are so much bigger, right? This, this value is so much bigger than this, that for these distributed concentrated areas, that's the most important part. So that's why the, this equation is what it is here, right? AZ squared. And that's why we don't have, we're not doing any of your normal IYs and IZs where, you know, you would look up a shape and look up what, you know, the moment of inertia is. That doesn't happen here. All you need, all you need to remember is these. So I equals the summation of, of those distances squared times the area. So hopefully that made sense. I'll just, yeah. However, when we're dealing with normal sections like that where it's not like these concentrated areas you have to do the parallel axis theorem and I'll do an example with that in a bit but just remember that it's a little bit different for these problems okay so if we expand that out it ends up being a1 times 0.4 minus 0.19 squared plus a2 parentheses a2 plus a3 0.19 times 0.19 squared plus a4 0.3 minus 0.19 squared okay simple enough i think we go one by one right a1 times the z position squared of a1 relative to the centroid now that's the most important part. So now you're defining your y, z axis from here. For, you can forget about this origin. So now it's here. Um, so it's 0.4, right, this distance, minus the z position of this, which I forgot what we calculated it to be, 0.19. So 0.4 minus 0.19 is this vertical distance from z, from c, the centroid, to a1. At, and then you just do that for every single one of these. Simple enough, right? And then, there right, yeah, and that equals 0.63 times 10 to the negative 4 meters to the fourth power. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Then we have the other two moments of inertia. IZ equals the summation of AI YI squared. And uh, I don't want to write it all out, but I, I will. A1 plus A2, 0.21 squared. A3 plus A4, 0.29 squared. Oh, that's it. And that equals 1.16 times 10, negative 4 meters to the fourth. Again, simple, right? Y position relative to the centroid squared, 0.21 for those, right? So it's the same 0.21 as before, okay? And then same thing for the other two areas, simple enough. And the final one is IYZ, also known as a product of inertia. And that is the summation of AI and multiplied by YI and ZI. So that they're both of the positions, right? So you're not squaring either one of them. It's, it's both of the, the positions. So I'll just, I won't write it all out. I'll just write out the solution. Negative 0.15 times 10 to the negative 4 meters to the 4. Okay, so that's step 2. Simple enough. Um, now we go to step 3. So what did they ask us at the beginning? They said to find the neutral plane um, so to find the neutral plane hopefully everything everybody wrote this down
So to find that neutral plane, I gave you guys the equation for alpha. It's this big, long equation. Uh, however, we can simplify it here because mz equals zero. So a lot of the terms go to zero. So we end up with the following equation, right? So step three, find. And this step three is not in general for all these problems, find the neutral plane. It's for this specific problem, this is step three. At this step three for these problems could be either this or find uh, sigma xx at a certain position or it could be various different step threes, but for this problem is find the neutral plane, right? And so we have the equation tangent alpha equals negative i, y, z, m, y, i, z, m, y. So this is after simplifying a bunch of things. Uh, and this ends up equaling 0.15 times 10 to the negative 4 over 1.16 times 10 to the negative 4. And this equals 0.13. So 0.13, we take the arc tangent of that to find alpha. And alpha ends up being 7 degrees, I think, if I wrote that right correctly. So um, now how do we find the neutral plane? Go to the centroid, all right, and take this angle and go positive clockwise from the y-axis. So, you know, I don't have a protractor, but I'll just assume it's something like that. All right, this is seven degrees. Uh, and yeah, that's that's basically it. And depending on the sign of M, oh wait, what? Yeah, and the, depending on the sign of M Y then either this side is going to be compressive, right? These, this one's going to uh, feel the compressive load, this one too, and these are going to feel the tensile or vice versa, depending on the sign of, of MY. Um, and an important thing to note about these problems is that these webs don't take any of these bending stresses, right? The bending stresses are only acting, I mean, they're acting everywhere, but they're being taken mostly by these, these spars, these concentrated areas. Um, yeah. And so now the final example, we get out of here because it's kind of late. All right, all right. This is example 4.2. Example 4.2. And it's that shape I was talking about earlier. Earlier, It's a Z section. Okay. And the dimensions are the following. From here to the midpoint is B. Thickness is T. What else? This is H. Okay, what else, anything else? I guess they call this point one. This is two, three, and four. Doesn't really matter. Okay, so they're telling you in this problem that you're given this section that has this dimensions, B and H. They, they don't give us numbers in this problem. They just tell us those are the, the variables. Uh, they said it's subjected to a positive MY. Okay, so a positive MY. Find the distribution of the bending stresses. So the dis when people tell you to find the distribution of the bending stresses, you just need to find the equation for sigma XX as, a, as it uh, relates to both Y and Z. And so that's just that big equation I showed earlier. Thankfully, in this problem here, uh, the first step, I talked about the first step being finding the centroid, right? So step one is find the centroid. So thankfully for this problem, it's symmetric, right? We have B here, B, oh, I guess this is B2. So this is B. So it's symmetric. So the centroid is going to be right in the geometric center. So step one is easy. 
the, the part that's interesting about this problem is step two is finding the moments of inertia. So it's a little bit different than the last example. So step two, find the eyes. Uh, like I said earlier, the total moment of inertia for this cross section, regardless of if it's IY, IZ, or IYZ, is the summation. You can split it up into three different, because there's, there's no way you can calculate this just, you know, by looking at the shape. It could be any abstract shape. You can divide it into manageable shapes that you know how to find the moment of inertia for. So in this case, we're dividing it into three different shapes, three rectangles. This rectangle here, this rectangle in the middle, and this rectangle up top. Uh, there's a flange, these two flanges, and this web here. Uh, so let's say we're trying to find uh, the moment of inertia for just this flange here. We're going to start with IY. So for flange 3, 4, IY is going to equal A3, 4. H over 2 squared plus IY prime. All right. So the way you do this is we're looking at this shape up here. Okay. We're going to find the centroid of that shape. Since these are manageable shapes, it's easy to find the centroid, right? For a rectangle, it's right at the center of the, of the, of the rectangle. So this is the new centroid. For that shape. IY, like I said, you're using the parallel axis theorem. So you're going to find the normal moment of inertia that, that you typically find for rectangles, and you're going to add to that the area times the, in this case, the vertical distance, right, because you're dealing with the Y, with the Y moment of inertia squared. So for rectangles, IY prime here. It's going to be, it's going to be BT cubed over 12. And this right here is just base times thickness, right? And we could do the same thing for IZ. So I'm not going to go, I'm not going to write it down because it's the exact same thing. And then IYZ um, is going to be A34 times both of those distances, right? H over 2, B over 2, plus the product of inertia at that other centroid, right? So prime. However, that product of inertia, remember what I told you guys earlier in class, if it's a symmetric cross section, at zero. So and this is going to be zero. All right? So it's just going to be that. I guess I probably shouldn't erase it, but equals zero. Uh, and so what you do is you basically find IY, IZ, IYC for each one of these three. Then you add them together, uh, you add all the IYs, all the IZs, and all the IYZs, and then you'll get the total moments of inertia for the entire cross-section. I'm just going to write them down really fast. All right. Okay, so after you've added all of them, then you end up getting the following. IY equals 2 BT H over 2 squared. I'm going to explain what these terms are in a bit. 2 BT cubed over 12 plus T H cubed over 12. All right, and then... IZ equals 2BT uh, 
and then IYZ. Ends up equaling Z squared H T over two. All right, so those are the three moments of inertia for this cross section. Uh, you can just by inspection kind of tell what each one of the terms are. Um, here, these are the distances, right? So this is the, the D squared portion of the parallel axis. Right, so for the two flanges, the top and bottom one, right, so that's why it's times two. Two times that area times that distance. Two times that area times that, times that distance. And then you have the, your normal moments of inertia, right? You have the two normal moments of inertia, and then you have this other moment of inertia. The reason there's not a third AD squared is because for that middle portion, the distance is zero. So there's not another one of these terms, okay? So that's where you have the middle portion moment of inertia. And down here, similarly, so that's good. So what's the, what was the goal of this problem? I forget. Okay, so we, we're trying to find the distribution of the bending stresses, I guess. Um, yeah, so for this problem, we're going to find also the orientation of the neutral axis. Almost done, almost done. So, step three, find neutral plane. Um, so, the equation is going to be the same as in the last one. Negative IYZ over IZ. It's simplified to that because MZ equals to zero. And this is going to equal negative 3h over 4b. And in this problem first, oh, and then the, that means alpha equals arctan of 3h over 4b. And so since we're not giving any values for h and b, we couldn't really solve for that. But in this problem, they tell us that Assume H equals 2B. So if that's the case, then we can solve for alpha. Alpha ends up being negative 56.3 degrees. So we can go back to this drawing. All right, we have our coordinate system. Y, Z. And we take 56 degrees, but it's negative. So we're going to go, remember counterclockwise is negative. It's counterintuitive, but uh, so... It'll be something like that. So this is the neutral plane. Um, and then I guess, yeah. And then they basically in this problem, they just investigate the stresses at various locations, one, two, three, and four. The way you would do that is you would write out the stress, the normal stress equation that we talked about earlier, that big equation, uh, just write it out again, sigma xx equals, Right, so you have that equation. That's a distribution of your stresses. You have basically everything in this problem, uh, assuming they give you an MY, and then you can plug in the Z and Y positions that you're interested in. Right, so you would typically want to look for the positions that are furthest away from the neutral plane. 
So in this drawing, even though this neutral plane is not exactly drawn exactly as it should be, we can see that position three is probably pretty far from the neutral plane and position two is also really far from the neutral plane. So we'd probably be interested in those positions. So we would plug in, you know, Z equals H over two, uh, Y equals zero, and you know, the opposite as well. Maybe we're interested in one and four. So we would plug in those values for Y and Z in this equation, find what the stresses are, and then um, we can compare that to the strength of the material. Is there anything else? So there, there's more in, in this chapter. I, have, I didn't finish it, of course. Um, one thing we talked about is if you know we have these structures. I'm just gonna briefly, briefly talk about it. So hopefully this all makes sense, right? This this um, neutral plane stuff, and you know, it's pretty easy, I think. Uh, one thing that we didn't talk about, I'll, I'll talk about next time, is if we have these these beams, right? We, they're loaded, right? Some function form, right? You'll have, you know, developing moments and developing shear forces at each cross section, each location, right? So you're going to have some MX and some VX, right? These VXs are the shear forces that are acting in, you've, you've done these shear moment diagrams, right? You've done it, we've talked about it, right? V and M. These Vs are related to tau XZ. We talked about at the very beginning how, based on the assumption from the Euler Bernoulli theory, we shouldn't have any of these because gamma XZ is zero, but in reality we do. Next time I'm going to cover how to get these tau XZs from <laughs> VX, and it, it all depends on basically the geometry of the cross section. And so I'm not going to cover it right now because I'm pretty much exhausted, but um, yeah, that's it. Thank you guys. Question? Yeah. For IYZ? Well, when you're trying to find alpha, you subtract, divide IYZ by IZ, right? Over there? Like when you try to find can you stand up and point to me where you're looking at? You, you got me lost, honestly. Mm -hmm. So when you're trying to find alpha, you need to divide this guy by this guy, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. So, yeah, you, but if you didn't neglect this one, like if you didn't say this is like very small equal to zero, you can't get like very nice number out of it. So that's why I didn't neglect this one. Because see, this guy has B squared, H, E. This guy has B squared, H squared, this So you wouldn't get like nice number out of if you didn't neglect this. You didn't say this is equal to zero. Did I not get a nice number? I don't remember when. Let's yeah, see. I just copied it straight from the book. <laughs> Let's look at it. I just copied it straight from the book, so I don't need to look. Um, so here, right? So negative three h over four b is what yeah. you're referring to. Yeah, you wouldn't get this if you didn't neglect this h t third over twelve. But it, but if you do, you do get that. I mean, think I think so. Yeah. Well, if that's the case, then yeah, that's probably what it is. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay. Good observation. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, okay, um, Dang, did you notice that, like, up on site? That's, Im that's impressive. I can't lie. That's good. That's crazy. Go ahead. Uh, I, just, I had a question about finding the, uh, the, str uh, the stresses. Uh -huh. For the Y and Z, are they being measured from, uh, like, where are they being measured from? Are they being measured from the neutral, like, plane or from, like... No, no, from, from the centroid. So the, the, it's still the same coordinate system. So the X and Y, of, I mean, the Z and Y are the centroid. Exactly, right? exactly, yeah. Thank you. So, I had no idea how to do any of uh, 4.1 or 4.2 from the homework until today, so thank you. Okay. Um, so 4.2, um, if it's rotated 45 degrees, it's mm -hmm. going like, to rotate this? Where's the rotation happening? Oh, man. I'm going to stop the recording. I don't want to expose myself.